the first musical instrument for me has always been the guitar. I started um, playing the guitar when I was four years old in the church. Uh, but before that, you know, I was aware of music because my mother played records by, well, she, well first of all, I came up in a very religious family. And my mom had records by people like the Dixie Hummingbirds. You've heard that group? Ira Tucker is my friend's uncle. Yeah. In fact, the very first guitar solo that I remember picking up by ear was by the guitarist in that group, Howard Carroll, a song called Standing by the Bedside of My Neighbor. That's the first, and I can play that solo for you note for note right now. I learned that when I was a kid. But um, mom had all of these records by the Dixie Hummingbirds, Shirley Caesar, James Cleveland, uh, the Fantastic Violineers, and um, there was music in the church. Uh, the first music that I heard was uh, gospel music in the church. And man, I don't know if you've ever been to a sanctified church or a Pentecostal church, but that music was so moving. Uh, the groove was so strong and uh, you get, I remember seeing a group of these old ladies, these church mothers singing these spirituals and it was just so powerful. It wasn't sophisticated, but it was just so powerful. You'd see grown men reduced to tears. And uh, I remember a lady playing a washboard with a coat hanger stretched out, you know, washboard with the coat, would stretch out the coat hanger, and she would beat out these rhythms on the, you know, with the coat hanger. It was making music, and then uh, I remember the tambourine, there was a guy in the church name, uh, his name was Brother Claude, who played the big bass drum. So, you know, it was just a lot of just great music, man. And uh, the first time I saw the guitar, we came to church one Sunday, and I remember seeing this instrument perched up against one of the, uh, the church pews. And it was this oddly shaped, this odd shaped instrument with a, uh, this wire that extended from this little hole in the guitar. It stretched from this little hole in, uh, of the guitar to this hole inside this, uh, on this box, which was the amplifier, of course. And that just fascinated me to see that. And then this guy picked up the guitar and started to play. And I knew right then that that would be my tool to express whatever I was uh, feeling inside musically. But even before I started to play the guitar, as I said before, I was aware of the different types of emotions and responses that you could get uh, out of people when you play music. You can connect with a total stranger when you play, someone who you've never, who you've never met before, but you play something on that instrument and it's like you know everything about them because they may laugh, they may cry. You just never know what might happen. And that's some pretty powerful, that's pretty powerful, man. Yeah. Well, no, I, I did not go to school for music. I learned, you know, people always make a big deal out of uh, one being self-taught. People always say, oh, Russell, you're self-taught. And that's okay, but there's only so much that a musician can learn on their own. Um, if you want to get better, if you want to excel, you have to, first of all, humble yourself, humble yourself and admit that there are some shortcomings, some things that you have to work on, and, you, and if you need to get better, if you really want to get better, you have to seek out musicians who are better than you, that you can learn from. So I was always searching for that. I listened to the records, and heck, that's, there's evidence right there when you see those records, you hear those records. You know right then and there if you got any kind of sense. Man, these guys on that record, they're on another level. I need to aspire to get to that level. So I knew that uh, I needed to get to that level, and if I was going to do that, I had to seek out musicians who could steer me in that direction. So there were a couple of guys in my hometown. Um, there was a teacher who taught at uh, one of the local universities there, Dr. Lamar Smith, a uh, saxophone player. He and uh, another one of the teachers, Dr. T. Marshall Jones, they took me under their wing and they would uh, allow me to do gigs with them. And they would show me things. And then there was another guy. I worked in his music store, the local music store, a gentleman by the name of Hunter Parker. He saw that I was uh, interested in this kind of music. So he would play things for me. He, he was the first one who introduced me to, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of this guy, Chicago guitarist by the name of George Barnes. And he turned me onto this record 
um, of George Barnes and this guitar player, Carl Crest, at Town Hall. And uh, that let me know that there were, there, was, there were other levels to get to. But even before that, the thing that, there were two things that were turning points in my life, Lee. The first one was uh, seeing George Benson perform on television. I saw him back in 1975. I was a few months shy of my 12th birthday. And uh, I saw this guy sitting on a stool. I can, I can see him right now. I, I even remember what he was wearing. He was wearing a, a black leisure suit, a black shirt with a big Billy Eckstein collar, and it had white polka dots in it, on it. And when I first saw him, he'd probably get mad if I said this, if you heard me say this, but I thought, because you know, back then George had the big afro and the big bushy mustache. You know who I thought it was? I thought it was Lamont Sanford from Sanford and Son. <laughs> I, said, I said, man, that's Lamont Sanford. And then I, said, I looked closer, I said, oh, wait a minute, that's somebody else. So he was playing, and I was like, whoa, this is, this is different. I'd never heard the guitar played like that before. Before then, I'd heard B.B. King, which was another one of, uh, another epiphany for me, him, seeing him and Chet Atkins, those guys. But when George played, I was like, wow, this, you know, the lines he was playing, the type of guitar he was playing, that big, he was playing a big full-bodied, hollow body. It was a, I found out later on that it was a Johnny Smith uh, Gibson. I eventually got one of those for myself because <laughs> I seen George playing one of those. But uh, I found out that uh, the guy's name was George Benson, and then the other guys in the band dig this. Vinnie Goodman playing the uh, clarinet. It was, you, you probably oh, remember the that sound, sound, the sound exactly, stage. soundstage. Chicago. The World of John Hammond was the right, name of John the program. Yeah. But uh, there was Milt Hinton on the bass, Papa Joe Jones was playing drums, Teddy Wilson was playing the piano. Uh, Roy Eldridge maybe? Hmm? Roy Eldridge maybe? No, 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 no. No, it was uh, Red Norbo. Now, Roy Eldridge wasn't on that one. But, uh, and, and when I saw that, I was like, whoa, this, I made a mental note of the guy's name, George Benson. So what I did, I went out, had a little job raking leaves, uh, and I took that money that I made raking leaves and I purchased two George Benson records. The first one was the George Benson cookbook. The second one was It's Uptown. I picked up those records and then there was a gentleman in my church, the guy who I mentioned earlier who played the big bass drum, Brother Claude, turned me on to two West Montgomery records. He said, oh, you like this guy? You like George Benson? I said, of course, yeah. He said, well, if you like George, you need to check out this guy. So he gave me two records, Smoking at the Half Note and Boss Guitar. And I was ruined for life. And something else, too. Um, the thing that I miss about LPs is that you could just, you know, they were so big and just so present. And I would read the liner notes. Uh, and I found out, because I, even at that age, I knew that these men did not get it out of the air. Something had to trigger the, the, the inspiration for them to want to play like that. So reading the liner notes, I came across this name, Charlie Christian. It was Charlie Christian. Uh, I went out and bought the Charlie Christian record. Um, I think that record it was, um, was Solo Flight. I, and, and it was Solo Flight, and then there was another one um, of the one of him playing at Minton's, the live record. And he's just, have you heard this record? Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Oh man. But I found out that Wes Montgomery and George Benson came from Charlie Christian, but I also came across other names like Tal Farlow, Johnny Smith, uh, Barney Kessel. I bought records by all these guys. I just I totally immersed myself in jazz guitar. And I also came across uh, names of guys who didn't play the guitar, but they were just as they're very significant figures in this music, like um, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Lester Young. I just immersed myself in, in, in the music, man. But that's how I got in, that's how I got into jazz. Russell Malone. <laughs> 